Ladies and gentlemen, this is Rex Bear with Leak Project. Tonight we have guest Paul A. Green, philosopher, author, screenwriter, occultist. Paul grew up in London and studied at Oxford and the University of British Columbia. Magical techniques are central to Mr. Green's writing practice, which is ultimately an exploratory process. Thus, his pursuit of the arcana of magic and the enigmas of esoterica is amplified not only in Babylon and other plays, but in poetry, as in his collection, Shearsman 2012, The Gospel Bunker, and in such novels as the clip-off, Libros Libertad, and Beneath the Pleasure Zones, Mandrake of Oxford 2014. He has made radio documentaries on aspects of the occult and paranormal, featuring Colin Wilson, Francis X. King, Ian Sinclair, among others, while the plays have been broadcast on BBC Radio, CBC Canada, RTE Ireland, and Resonance FM. All have been staged by Travesty Theatre and New Theatre Works. He has performed or presented at many venues, most recently at the Final Academy, Magic Art Bristol, the Moot with no name, the Electric Palace Hastings, and St. Augustine's Tower in Hackney. He has especially enjoyed collaborations, whether with musicians like the late Vincent Crane or with the artist Jeremy Welsh, creating video poems like The Slow Learner and Radial City. Mr. Green now lives in Hastings, it's great to have you on the show tonight with us here at the Leak Project, Paul. How are you doing? I'm I'm doing very well, thanks, Rex. And it's, um, it's a pleasure to be to be invited. Um, I'm actually in Hastings, which is about fifty miles from London, um, in the town where Alistair Crowley died in nineteen forty in nineteen forty seven. So there's a sort of occult connection, if you like, in the in in the actual location I'm situated with. Although that's not the reason I necessarily moved here, but there are sort of Alistair Crowley landmarks in Hastings. The house where he lived was demolished many years ago, um, but there are still places around town where he used to hang out, and you know, I like to think his spirit sort of hovers vaguely in the background somewhere. Was he buried out there as well? No, he was... Um, it's a strange story. Um, he died in forty-seven. He was cremated in Brighton, and then the ashes went to America to Carl uh, Germer, one of his disciples, who apparently buried them under a tree. And then... Germa sort of forgot where they were buried and I think somebody, and there's a possibility that they got lost or scattered or dug up or something, so they you know, they they disappeared upon the wind, I think. But uh, yeah, it's uh, Hastings, Hastings is, is a good place to be there's a lot of um, cultural activity going along here and lots of music and lots of writers, so um, you know, I feel, I feel quite at home here. Sure, and I know the UK is very the culture out there there's been hermetics and the occult and mysticism for just thousands of years out there and it's it's very fascinating what really got you into the occult paul well it's a it's a curious thing um i was edu educated as a roman catholic my father was a catholic and outwardly he was a very conventional man but he had this you know, there were strange books that he would purchase, sometimes with the bewilderment of my mother. And so, at so quite, a, at quite a young age, I read uh, O. A. E. Waite's books on uh, on ceremonial magic and uh, Sim the Simmons biography of Crowley, and, and so on and so forth. And this kind of I I pursued this um, at various levels, not too seriously at first. And then when I was I was in Canada in the early seventies, late sixties, early seventies. And I was sort of seeing myself through grad school by doing some um, freelance broadcasting. And I suggested a program about Alistair Crowley and magic to a CBC producer I knew. And he said, oh, go for that. So I started doing a lot more reading and research. And I'm not a joiner. I've never really been a member of a particular order. There are certain sort of processes and practices I've investigated. Um, but to me... The real magical act is the act of writing, um, partly because of the techniques that I've, that I've used. I mean, things that are common to other writers, like, you know, sort of automatic writing that surrealists use, um, cut-ups like William Burroughs used. Burroughs, incidentally, has got a very strong occult strain in his work. There's a particularly good book I'd recommend, written by a friend of mine, actually, called um, The Magical Universe of William Burroughs. But that's an aside. There, so there are certain sort of procedures uh, I got interested in at some points in sigil magic. Um, and the, 
there were certain things that one experimented with as a, uh, as a writer. I've always felt that writing is a magical act. You create mental pictures, you create, hopefully you create sort of little archetypes that will resonate in other people's mental spaces. Um, but I'm, you know, I don't make any claims to be a great magus or anything. I've always seen myself as a scribe um, insofar as I have any formal religious beliefs at all now. I do identify quite a bit with the Egyptian god Thoth, who was the god of magic, the god of writing, um, who compares pretty well to the sort of Jehovah, whereas Je the biblical Jehovah sends plagues and destruction and slays the firstborn. You know, Thoth, you know, teaches the Egyptian writing and magic and all sorts of, you know, skills. Um, so I think it's a deity. He's pretty good. But um, I'm, drif I'm, I'm drifting here. Well, you know, Rick, so ask, ask me a question. I'm really glad you brought up Thoth because that's, that's a perfect uh, segue there. I've always been fascinated with Thoth as well. And do you think that the emerald tablets of Thoth are legit or do you think that that's something that was kind of made up? Well, I think the whole sort of Thoth Hermit Tristamagistus thing evolved over a long, over quite a long period of time. Some people have argued that, that, that the, the hermetic texts were actually written in the early sort of post-Christian era in the second or third centuries. Others, others claim that there's a much f further connection back as to whether the, as whether the, ab sorry, the emerald tablet uh, exists in any physical form now, I don't know. And I suppose I have my doubts, but as to the basic concept of as above, so below, um, as William Butler put it, as the great Smaragdine tablet said, um, then I think uh, you know it's a it's an it's a useful concept. Let me put it like that. Well, there's a lot in the. Have you read the actual texts? Yes, I have. Yes, I mean the, the text. The texts are very resonant, I think. And uh, but as as to what as to whether we can link, how far we can link them back to the Egyptian god Thoth, I don't know. Not being uh, an Egyptologist. Are you familiar with uh, the majority or some of the, I guess you'd say, higher archetype gods of Egypt, ancient Egypt? Uh, well, obviously, through reading, re reading Crowley um, and reading uh, the Book of the Law, uh, one encounters Horus, the Nuit, and, and Set, uh, to name three, three principal, principal figures. And uh, I think that the... That again, as archetypes, they are, you know, psychologically very powerful and, and, and very resonant. Do you think that they were real? I mean, uh, real people at one time, or actual gods that came down from the heavens? Well, once again, another op another open question. Um, to some extent, all right, they could be based on powerful or influential individuals in the prehistory of Egypt or the prehistory of other societies. Uh, they could be based on some kind of external or alien intervention in the past. To, um, to some extent, they could be entities who exist because we have imagined them. Um, I don't, are you familiar with the work of the British uh, chaos magician Peter Carroll? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Peter. Yeah. Absolutely. Great guy. Yeah. Great, yeah. Fun. I mean, I think he's the most interesting and important writer on uh, on, on the occult since, since Crowley, and I've you know done one of his Arcanorium online studies. Uh, what was that well. like? Uh, it was fascinating. The thing that interested me most of all that most of the correspondence uh, on uh, on the Arcanorium College uh, were terrifyingly intelligent physicists, and you know I was soon struggling to keep up with their their mathematics. Um, because my background is in English and the, and the humanities rather than physics and maths. And actually, the paradox is that the sciences are actually seem to be quite good training for magicians, you know, referencing, you know, Crowley's study of chemistry at Cambridge. Um, yeah, that was that was very that was very stimulating. And I think that um, I think that Carroll's created a, you know, a new paradigm, really. Um, one that's more open ended, less less hierarchical. Um, more fluid, uh, and I found it throughout the certainly throughout the novels, uh, the idea of a chaotic universe in which a multiplicity of entities evolved in a way as a kind of 
mirror image of our interaction with them. I, I think that's fascinating. I, I don't know if I've explained that t terribly well because it's, it's a concept that is difficult to grasp. Uh, but I think that Carol is uh, Carol's a key figure, no doubt about it. Now, the chaos magic is uh, an incredible form of you know different modules to achieve results. Um, you know, I've talked to several people like Andrea Vitimus on chaos magic. Um, I had a, a really cool show here the other day on chaos magic, and what what I find fascinating um, is the the results connected with uh, you know a, a proper manifestation, you know, doing something the correct way, you, you get results, you can see it for yourself. And, you know, one of the things too, uh, about Aleister Crowley that is just, you know, so I think made him ahead of his time was he really kind of pushed this concept of do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. And people would look at that. I mean, there's, you, there's two different mindsets to that statement. Uh, in my opinion, and I, I would love to hear what you have to say about this, because I could be way off. But in that statement, will it would be somebody's highest purpose and anything below that is obviously just you know it doesn't matter as much and some people think it means you can go do whatever the hell you want and there's no repercussions yeah i'd agree with you on that i i think by will he meant you know your deepest aspirations what you um what you are destined to do um you know every man every man and woman is a star and follows a particular path or or or, or orbit uh, but finding that path and dis disentangling it from all the distractions along the way um, is i think you know a a bit of a danger zone in fact in all the occult dramas that i've written in the uh, babylon and other plays this this is a recurrent theme um I mean, we'll, we'll talk a bit later about uh, Jack Parsons because Parsons is a more complex figure than this. But, for example, um, have you ever heard of a British jazz and rock musician called Graham Bond? Yes. Right. Uh, and you know that he committed suicide by, or apparently committed suicide, or perhaps was nudged in some direction to commit suicide under, the, under a subway train in, in 1974 in London. Bond was... Uh, um, Bond became an avid disciple of uh, Crowley and Thalema in the late 60s, early 70s. But he seemed to have regarded that more or less as a license to do what the hell he liked, with sometimes disastrous re, you know, repercussions, both both for himself and and those closest to him. And I think he, I think you know there's always a temptation to feel that if you you know, if you buy the books and you have the robes and you imbibe, you know, imbibe large quantities of substances, that somehow this is automatically going to elevate you to um, some kind of godhead. But I'm afraid in Graham's case, it didn't work out that way at all because he he sort of spiraled down into massive heroin addiction, which he couldn't handle. His relationships broke down. Um, he, it is alleged, and there's good reason for it, that he had an abusive relationship with his stepdaughter um, and eventually was in a position where he, he couldn't hold a band together, he couldn't work with anybody, um, and he, he, you know, he drifted into, uh, uh, in, uh, in, into suicide. So, if you like, that, that's an example of how you know, misplacing your true will, because I think Bond was destined to the great things. He was a brilliant musician. He was a very charismatic performer. He was one of the um, sort of catalysts in, you know, the development of British jazz and rock. He nurtured people like Jack Bruce and Ginger Baker, who promptly went off to form Cream. Um, he nurtured lots lots of other musicians, um, including my my late friend Vincent Crane, who was um, Arthur Brown's keyboard player. You've probably heard of the crazy world of Arthur Brown. Uh -huh. I'm, the God, I'm the God of Hellfire. Um, yeah, I mean, Graham is an example of a man with tremendous potential who at the same time couldn't really sort of control the forces that, that he was dealing with and couldn't control his habit. I mean, in the end, both Crowley and Burroughs managed to contain, if you like, um, their, uh, their morphine or in Burroughs case, m methadone habit and sort of managed to live with it on a daily basis. But um, Bond, Bond was just complete, completely out, out of control. So there's an example perhaps of somebody who, um, 
had enormous potential, whose true will should have been to gone on to be a major figure in, in, in British popular music. But he blew it, tragically. Well, and also the, you know, the Beatles were really into the occult mysticism, Aleister Crowley. I mean, even on one of their album covers, they had him there. And he, he certainly has had a huge impact on society as we know it in the entertainment industry, the political realms, etc. cetera. Um, one of the things that I found, I did read his, what he called Magnum Opus, the Book of Four, and you know the four different books in there, the Book of the Law, and then he talked about practical magic and stuff like that. But one specific part in that book that really tripped me out was when he, I'm trying to remember it exactly, and I'm sure you know this part as well, uh, he talks about how he would take blood from kids and use it for his rituals. Ah, oh, now this is a ah oh, is and, this the is, it, is this the famous um, comment? Um, the Master Therian made this sacrifice of approximately 120 times a year. Correct. And then he said, "I'm telling you this," or something like he worded it as, "I'm telling people this uh, in hopes that they'll understand it," or something like that. Ah, oh, now what was happening there was. Um, something a little, a, a little different. Um, Crowley, like Parsons, his disciple, practiced uh, sexual magic. And so, some of it was with partners, but some of it was, auto, was eighth degree autosexual magic, which was effectively masturbation. Um, but in a magical context, it was the discharge of a vital bodily fluid. Usually, um, in the case of Parsons, it was onto um, a slip of parchment with an Enochian symbol on it. Um, and what Crowley was saying was that he'd, um, he'd sacrificed his precious vital fluid uh, in the cause of magic 120 times a year, and that this was a sort of veiled way of talking about it. Um, because Crowley was... he. In some ways, he was extremely sort of extrovert and outspoken about sexual magic, but he was also um, a little bit wary of talking about it too explicitly in some contexts. Um, I think one of the things to bear in mind about Crowley that he was bisexual, and I think the gay element in his personality was something that he wasn't always very happy with, or that he was defensive about. I remember that he grew up in the eighteen he grew up in the eighteen nineties. Um, you know, when Oscar Wilde was was tried and jailed and um, for homosexual practices, um, homosexuality wasn't legal in this country until long till twenty years after Crowley's death. So there are aspects of sex that he he would talk about quite openly, you know, um, but sometimes he would hide it in veiled language. Um, so that's what the reference is. All the stuff about Crowley's human sacrifices. Uh, I, it was a sort of tabloid invention. Uh, he did sacrifice animals on a couple of occasions, which is something I'm, I'm, which is a to me is a less attractive aspect of his personality. Um, you know, I'm quite happy about him sort of you know coming over bits of uh, parchment, but you know, slitting the throat of goats, I think, is perhaps going you know too far. Uh, but uh, so he did. I mean, he Crowley was extraordinary in that. He was in some ways a victim of his own publicity. He was desperate, I think, to make his mark. He was desperate to rebel against that appallingly oppressive Christian fundamentalist upbringing that he'd had with the uh, Plymouth Brethren. He was desperate to 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 wake up um, a rather a rather sort of stodgy world of um, everyday Edwardian uh, daily life, and so he would adopt the he would make these sort of uh, he would make outrageous statements. Um, he would wind people up in all sorts of ways. The tabloids would take him up. He'd soon be the wickedest man in the world, um, according to them. And I think you know, Crowley was so complex and so and, and so paradoxical um, that effectively, I think he, I think he did himself a disservice by endlessly sort of uh, seeking the limelight. At the same time, I can see why he why he was why he was driven to do it, given the circumstances in which he'd been brought up. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely, hundred percent. I mean, you know, he did talk about his upbringing, and you know, obviously, he, he went to the the opposite side of the spectrum. When <laughs> absolutely. He, so, and I can see that. You know, I mean, that's just like a kid rebelling from their parents, a hundred percent. So. One of the things that I find fascinating, and you brought this up, uh, or I mean a little bit, uh, when you talked about uh, the, the jazz musician Graham that you know died from mysterious circumstances. I'm sure you've heard of the 27 Club. 
No, I haven't. Enlighten me. Okay. The 27 Club is a group of musicians and movie stars that died at the age of 27. I'll give you a few examples. Jim Morrison, Jimi Hendrix, Amy Winehouse, um, a whole bunch more that at strange circumstances at the age of 27, they died. And there's a lot of speculation. Uh, Kurt Cobain was one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's a lot of speculation that they might have signed some type of contract, uh, you know, a, a blood contract, a soul contract or whatever to get that fame. And then once they reached it, their, their, or if, you know, their contract was met, bang, they're 27 and then that's their, their sacrifice. Brian Jones, Janis Joplin. Um, I mean, there's so many more people that at 27, it's like, that's the magic number. Bang. They're, they're done. Right. So what are your, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, Bomb died when he Bomb was born in 38 and he died in 74. So that makes him 36. Yeah. He was 36. But talking, talking of contracts, so there are a couple of strange stories about Bond. Um, in Bond was in America in the early seventies. And he'd been brought over by this guy who was going to, who said that he was going to manage Bond and turn him into a, you know, an international superstar. Uh, and Bond, uh, but there, there was a problem with Bond's work permit. So he signed a contract without reading the small print. And the, the manager said, don't worry, I'll, I'll take care of everything. And then Bond's wife realized not that they, they weren't getting any money. And the contract actually said that 90% um, of it was going to the manager. So Bond performed a right in my play about about Bond, I he I don't know what right I gave him the you know the bornless right uh, that, that Crowley that Crowley often used, a slightly modified. So uh, in my play, Bond standing in the in the City of Angels in Los Angeles, you know, calls down forces in retribution. Um, the, the next day, um, the manager's wife was involved in a major car accident in which in which some unfortunate person was killed. Uh, there's another story about Bond told to me by the by a friend of mine, a British writer and musician called Pete Brown, who was the song, who was the, one of the songwriters for the Cream, and uh, he'd worked with Bond as well. And he was with Bond in Germany in the late in the early, late sixties or early seventies, and they were. It was a time when Ger when Germany was going through a very turbulent phase of. Um, of, of revolution and terrorism um and there was a particularly sort of heart there was a publisher news a newspaper magnet called axel springer who was sort of denouncing you know hippies and radicals and, and so on very fiercely bond appeared at this gig and um Bond said quite casually, who's the worst man in germany and the guy organizing the gig said oh it's axel springer uh who was a kind of German equivalent, I suppose, of you know Rupert Murdoch, could, you know, name some other big newspaper proprietor. Bond pronounced an ancient Egyptian curse, and the next day there was an explosion um, at Springer's offices. Um, Springer was unhurt, but very, various people were injured. Bond's Bond's career seems to have been surrounded with these sort of strange synchronicities that seem to have been been, been linked to his his ritual practice, but not necessarily in a very constructive way. But uh, anyway, you mentioned contracts, and I just thought I'd throw that in on passing. Yeah, thank as, you. Yeah, as for as for deals with the devil, I mean, Robert Johnson, the blues singer, was supposed to have uh, signed a deal with the devil. Um, but uh, and there is a song, there's an old blues which I won't attempt to sing, um, called "Dealing with the Devil," which I think is a Johnson song, and I think Sonny Boy Williamson sang it as well. But but anyway, that's another digression. Um, I tell you what, do you want to? Um, I don't know how you want to work through this. Do you want to get back to to Babylon or the Babylon working? Because we've yeah, got a bit of back, we, we've got a bit of background now on on Crowley uh, and the sort of you know uh, a Absolutely. few things about the occult world in general. So you know, wh uh, where do you want to go? Yeah, you, let's transfer over to that. If you could tell our listeners about the Babylon working, the play, and you know the the players, etc. That'd be fantastic. Right. Okay. Jack Parsons is his life is an enigma and his death is a mystery. Uh, the, Jack Parsons was two persons. He was one of the pioneers, the pioneer, in fact, of American solid fuel rocket research. And the work that he carried out in the 1930s and 40s uh, created a reliable solid fuel technology that was developed and used in everything from the, the Minuteman missile to, in fact, the boosters for the um, 
for the space shuttle. So he is uh, an important man in the history of American space travel. Uh, he was also uh, Alistair Crowley's leading disciple for a while uh, on the west coast of America in, in Pasadena, California, where he became for a while the leader of the Agape Lodge of Crowley's Order of Oriental Templars. So, um, as for the Babylon working, uh, it's a long and complicated story, but I'll try and tell it as, as best I can. Um, Parsons, Parsons came from a fairly wealthy background, but they fell upon hard times. Uh, he was um, he wasn't able to stay, to stay through college, or, and so he left and he worked in a explosives factory for, for, for a couple of years, learning a great deal about explosives. He'd always been fascinated by rockets and explosions and the possibility of space travel, and he avidly read science fiction, and he was fascinated by the dark and mysterious. He once said that he'd encountered the devil at the age of 14 and had been very terrified. Um, whether that was a parson's embellishment or whether it referred to something deeper, I, I, I don't know. So you have this very, you have this very bright, very charismatic guy. Um, he blanks his way into uh, what later became the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, JPL, um, in the late 1930s, uh, without many formal qualifications, but with a great gift for understanding the possibilities of, of rocket fuels and explosives. He conducts various experiments um, uh, in the uh, around Pasadena. Uh, with the sort of the, the Caltech um, being rather sort of worried about his sometimes reckless experimenting, uh, and he he starts to read about Crowley and about occultism, and in the late 1930s, I think in 19, or 39 or 1940, he joins the uh, Pasadena Lodge of the Ori of the Order of Oriental Templars. Uh, it's led by an expatriate Englishman called Wilfred Smith. Um, Smith is a bit sort of lackadaisical. And Alistair Crowley, who is very dependent on the Agape Lodge because the, the Agape Lodge subscriptions are effectively his, his only income, um, thinks that, that, that Parsons sounds a, a, a far more sort of dynamic figure. And very rapidly, Parsons becomes uh, the, uh, the head of the Agape Lodge. Um, but there are complications. Um, Parsons' wife, Helen, is rapidly seduced by, uh, by Smith, and this becomes a, and actually has a child by, by him, and this becomes a test of Parsons' sort of libertarian views of sexuality. Uh, do what thou wilt to be the whole of the law, but you know, he's doing it with my wife. Um, but Parsons decided he had to overcome this, he had, he, he had to deal with this, which he did, and um, he eventually hitched up with um, her sister, Betty, and they became an item. Uh, he had a certain amount of money. He bought a large house in, in Pasadena, in Orange Grove Avenue, which rapidly became the, called the Parsonage. And it became a focal point for science fiction writers who used to hang out there, like Robert Heinlein, um, other sort of mystics and magicians from the local OTO, um, actors, engineers. Um, he once put an ad in the local paper saying, Bohemians wanted. Um, and he sort of selected people as to how sort of nonconformist they were. And... Uh, how willing they, they would be to fit in with a sort of very libertarian style uh, of the lodge. And they started conducting, the Gnostic Mass used to be conducted in Smith's attic, but now it was conducted in Parsons' mansion. Um, and he became increasingly interested in the, in the female archetype of Babylon, um, who occurs in in John Dee's Enochian magical system as a recurrent figure, who is the Scarlet Woman in, Alice, in um, Alistair Crowley's um, Book of the Law. Uh, and he, he, he comes increasingly uh, engrossed in this. And then in at some point in 1945, uh, Lafayette Ronald Hubbard arrives yeah, uh, yes, that Hubbard, um, later of Scientology fame, arrives and um, Parsons is absolutely overwhelmed by this, another very sort of charismatic figure. 
and they begin to carry out magical experiments together uh, to so that Parsons can find um, that he can actually somehow bring into existence Babylon. The experiments went on throughout 19, through early, early, early 1946. They involved the kind of sort of, you know, ritual sexual activities that I've talked about earlier with Crowley. They involved long, inca uh, long incantations from uh, the Book of the Law, the Gnostic Mass, and from the calls and keys of the Enochian system. And Hubbard sort of assisted a scribe and... Um, and they began to generate phenomena. Some of them are rather odd. There was a, a um, one of the strange things about the Enochian language is that it is a coherent language, although it sounds like sort of random babble of syllables. It is actually very structured and it has a grammar and a syntax. And um, Dee's scryer, Edward Kelly, actually dictated a kind of dictionary to translate um, the Enochian tongue. And towards the at a fairly late stage in the in the workings, um, Parsons started to get auditory phenomena. He got one night he got a series of very loud knocks, and of its own volition, a large table lamp um, crashed over. Now the word for lamp in Enochia is hubar, H U B A R, and it's very tempting to see a connection there between. Uh, between L, between L, L. Ron Hubbard, the by the end of the uh, end of the workings, as they progressed, they began to generate more and more phenomena. Also, also Parsons perceived it. Um, that he, they believed that they they'd seen a tall, yellowish brown entity. There were inexplicable failings in the electrical system. Um, Hubbard got an enormous electrical shock. Uh, which he claimed paralysed his uh, his right arm. Um, they were, I think, by by the end of, end of the end of this first working, they were in a pretty pretty strange space. And then, not quite out of the blue, because she had met Jack very briefly before, a few months previously, there came to see Jack uh, Marjorie Cameron Parsons, whom Jack immediately identified as his Scarlet Woman. And so that was the first phase of the uh, 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 of the Babylon working. Um, what is a Scarlet Woman? Well, a Scarlet Woman, um, according to Crowley, the Scarlet Woman uh, could be identified with the Scarlet Woman in the Book of Revelations in the Bible, where she's presented in a very negative light, being seen through a sort of Christian lens as being um, destructive, assertive, sexualized and so on um but he but as far as Crowley was concerned the uh, the scarlet woman um was was babylon was if you like the woman of the future who was strong fierce independent sexually self-confident um Crowley always Crowley used to call his mistresses scarlet women um and he will frequently talk about the union of the beast and the scarlet woman as both a sexual union and also a mystical union as well um he's uh sorry let me just backtrack there uh, does that answer your question about the scarlet woman yeah thank you very much yeah, 100%. okay right right okay then so that's so that's the first phase that's the first phase of the working um cameron and parsons have a very intense affair initially um cameron is rather skeptical or dismissive of Parsons' magic. She sees him as being, you know, a brilliant, dynamic guy who's wonderful in bed and so on. Um, and they spent, I think they spent two weeks in bed engaged in sexual magic. Uh, but, as far as, uh, but it's later on, with Ron's involvement, that they begin, they begin to take part in a second series of workings. Now, here there is some confusion and disagreement about what Parsons was actually trying to do. And it depends, you know, what source you read and if you compare what Cameron said and what actually happened and so on. Cameron, Ca um, Parsons said that he was, that the second series of workings were going to bring forth, they were going to bring forth Babylon. Um, it wasn't clear to what extent he expected 
uh, Babylon to be born as a physical child to Cameron. Um, apparently she did become pregnant, but terminated it, which rather suggests that he wasn't perhaps thinking in those terms, although he might have been at some point. It's as if he expected a, a, a some kind of force to arise that would be um, the strong female, um, if you like, um, a feminist force uh, that would transform uh, the world and transform society and transform people's perception of, of belief and understanding that would create a new... Um, a new religion, if you like. Um, Which is and, Bolima, do you think? Well, it's an... No, oh, Parson, Parsons thought that this was an extension of Thelema. He felt that Thelema was a bit too sort of masculine-oriented, and he felt that the feminine current had to be given an, an equal balance. So as, as far as we can see, he sort of cast this role on Cameron at first, and then Cameron was still very sceptical about it. Years later, after Parsons' death, she thought for a while that you know that she was the Scarlet Woman. And then later, and, and, and then later on, she realised perhaps that you know she was just an expression of a of, of some invisible entity or, or presence that was transform that had this transformative quality. Um, it's I mean dealing with this whole topic, it's difficult because there are there's still a lot about Parsons. That we don't know. I mean, when I started writing this play in '98, I what I had to go on was um, the various biographies of Crowley, obviously. Um, the um, let me see, there was a very good article by a British occultist called Michael Staley called "Beloved of Babylon." Um, there was Russell Miller's book about Hubbard, which had something about the working, and there were uh, several websites that have now disappeared. There was a very good one called Avatar of the Eleventh Hour, which is now down. Um, there was another one called Jack Parsons on the origins of the American Space Pro Program that's now disappeared. And so I was kind of cobbling things together based on um, what I could find on the internet and, and, and general reading. Um, and even as I was, I, wrote, I rewrote the play several times, and that, that, particularly when um, Sex and Rockets came out, which was by Paul Rydine writing under the name of John Carter, which is very good on, on the magical aspects. And later, later on, there's uh, another good biography of Parsons um, by George Pendle called Strange Angel. And that's not so good on the magic, but it's very good on, on, on the rocketry side of things. So those two books give you, a, give you an overall picture. But I was working to some extent in the dark. I was also writing a play uh, where one has to be selective, uh, you've got, you know, 90 minutes um, to tell a long, complex story. So things will get elided together and compressed. Um, so, you know, all art is a lie, as Jean Cocteau said, but all, all, all art lies in order to tell the truth. And I, I think although there are some factual and chronological inaccuracies in my play, and there are some things which we simply don't know the answer to, I like to think that it's got this essence of Jack as a kind of questing figure who took, Great risks, great risks with his personal life, great risks with rocketry as well, as we'll see in a minute. Um, anyway, the, uh, eventually the, the Parsons-Hubbard relationship fractured when um, Hubbard went off to the East Coast ostensibly to start a yacht importing business, taking with him Betty and all of Parsons' savings because he'd sold, he'd sold the big mansion by then. And uh, Parsons found out that... Um, in, that uh, Hubbard was having a you know a wild riotous time on the east coast with Betty having bought three yachts and obviously had no intention of coming back, so he went he went after him and uh, once again uh, Parsons performed a ritual he called um, on Bartsville, um the 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 dog of war, and very conveniently that while Betty and Ron were out at sea in one of the yachts there was a serious storm and they had to come back to harbour. Um, Anyway, eventually the, part, the partnership that he set up with Hubbard was dissolved, but Hubbard somehow seemed to uh, get most of the money or at least get the yachts. And Parsons was, uh, was hit quite hard by this financially, but you know, very deeply emotionally. So he moved away from Thelemic magic for a while. He thought that it was too complex, too hierarchical, 
um, for the average person. And in his later books, he wrote about what he called the witchcraft, which seems to have been a sort of simple, more simpler, more intuitive kind of magical practice, closer, in fact, to sort of traditional witchcraft and perhaps cl closer to, you know, to Wicca, which was evolving in Europe, particularly in England at the same time. And then, of course, um, there was the ultimate tragedy. I mean, Parsons' behaviour brought him to the attention of the authorities. In um, At one point, he was considered a serious security risk. They thought he was a loose cannon, um, that he'd run off to Israel with secrets that he'd purloined from the Hughes Aircraft Company. He got fired from Hughes Aircraft. He got um, his... He was cross-examined um, by the FBI, who thought he was a com might be a communist, or that he, or that he, his occult connections might be a security risk in some way. So at one point he was reduced to working in, in a gas station, and later on he picked up a job working for um, explosives and special effects company. Um, and by 1952, after a series of up and down relationships with with Cameron, they got back together again. Uh, and they were going to go to Mexico, where Jack had hopes of starting a laboratory and possibly was possibly a factory. And on on our summer afternoon in 1952, he went. He he'd rented a little sort of coach house type place, um, and where he kept all his explosives. And he went back to pack a few explosives. And it looks like he dropped some fulminate of mercury. And that explosion set off another explosion. And as a result, um, he was very, the laboratory was wrecked. He was very seriously injured. He lost an arm and half of his face and only lived for a few hours afterwards. And of course, there the, the enigma widens. I mean, the, the conventional explanation is, which is quite reasonable, is Parsons was always reckless using explosives. Um, he sweated a lot. He could well have dropped something. He was in a hurry. He was he was packing the car to go off to Mexico um, with Cameron. There is an there are other strands in the story though that uh, are interesting. Back in 1938, Parsons was called in as an expert witness in the trial of a Los Angeles cop who'd murdered a private detective who was delving into city corruption, who had murdered this private detective, or attempted to murder him, I should say, because the guy actually survived, by putting a bomb in his car. And Parsons was called in at the age of 23 as a bright young expert witness to, to analyse the aftermath of the explosion and to uh, describe how this bomb, how a bomb could could uh, cause this level of destruction and Parsons created a big impression in court because he actually came in with a replica bomb that he constructed and waved it at the jury and everybody was very impressed and he had a certain amount of press coverage for this and people had, and Cameron for a while thought that possibly this Kinnett would have got out of jail for attempted murder um, the previous year and possibly it was a revenge attack and she always claimed that the explosion was actually under the floor and not, not on the floor or on the table there's another line of inquiry, which is that um, the FBI wanted to get rid of him, um, again, because they felt he was a security risk. I mean, he was a man who pioneered, you know, some of America's leading rocket technology, and um, he hung about with dubious people, and he might sort of go off to, there was talk of him going off to Israel at one point and starting a rocket manufacturing program there. Um, the... There was also a rumour that has never really been substantiated that he was trying to create a homunculus in his laboratory and this created an explosion. Uh, there's also, in the play, I suggest, well, it's implied that, yes, Parsons is in a hurry and he's nervous and uh, he's, he's, he needs, needs to pack all this stuff away. But at the same time, there are certain, if you like, subliminal impulses that, or possibly been implanted in his brain um, by Hubbard. Um, one of the uh, texts, or, or, so one of the channelings, I should say, that Hubbard got in the second working was a was something about thou shalt become living flame. And in the play, I've suggested there are sort of internalised voices in uh, in his head. Uh, with overall the voice of Ron saying, "Thou shall become living flame. Drop it, drop it, drop it," and he drops it. Uh, so, an extraordinary figure. Um, it's interesting, seeing as you like synchronicities, and so do I, that in 1947, 
you have the death of Crowley, you have the end of the Babylon working, you have the discovery of lysergic acid by Hoffman in Switzerland, uh, you have Burroughs, Ginsburg, um, Kerouac and Co. meeting in New York, you have the UFO sightings of Kenneth of um, Keith Arnold. I'm glad um, you brought that one up. Yeah, and uh, you have um, the development of the transistor. You have John van Neumann and co. bringing the computer. Uh, but uh, let, I let, said I said enough. You you bring something. You bring well, something. I just got uh, a, yeah. I, I got carried away. I got on a roll there. Sorry about that. Please, no apologies necessary. That was fantastic. I was just enjoying the ride, man. Um, so Lamb is uh, a figure that Crowley makes contact with. And the reason I'm bringing Lamb up is because if you see a picture or a drawing that Crowley puts together, Lamb looks very similar to what many call an alien or you know a gray, the typical right, Hollywood yeah. version. So, And then in 47 also, you've got Roswell, this incredible phenomenon of all these flying saucers and abductions. And there's some speculation there that some of the works these guys did actually created an opening or a portal to another dimension. And I wanted to get your opinion on that. Right. Kenneth Grant, who was Crowley's... Um to my mind, Crowley's most interesting disciple, although he sort of veered away, he got sort of disinherited by the by the American OTO, um, precisely because he was making these sort of connections. He said, uh, in 1947, Parsons opened a portal and something flew in. Um, it's a very tempting speculation. Um, I think... I don't have the exact reference to this at my fingertips, but certainly after Parsons' death... Uh, Cameron believed that she'd seen uh, that she'd seen UFOs. There was a rumor that Parsons actually knew um, Arnold, the businessman with the private plane, who'd seen, who actually coined the phrase "flying saucers" um, uh, uh, back in, back in '47. Uh, La yes, the Lamb phenomenon is is very very curious. Um, I think I think uh, Crowley drew it back in I think with. One of his scarlet women, I think it was Roddy Minor, and um, she, she, there was a, a sort of exchange between them, and um, I can't remember. I can't remember the exact wording, but afterwards, Crowley drew this curious entity called, called Lamb. And um, sorry about that. I, was, I think that, I, I must just switch off my email. It's prompted me there. I'll just go. I'll, I'll just go back a bit. Hang, hang on a minute there. Sure. Sorry, right, I've just uh, my email has told me that David Cameron has done something or hasn't. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't I'm just, you know. Oh, 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 that was another weird thing. Um, the night the play Babylon was performed uh, in November and uh, sorry, in December the sixteenth, two thousand and five, uh, the Conservative Party in the UK was still in opposition, but there was some confusion there was so you know there were sort of battles over the leadership and i will swear and this is from memory i can't perhaps i will swear that on the night of the play i opened the evening standard and it, uh, the headline was cameron takes charge <laughs> which, uh, uh, except it was the wrong cameron i, I wish it hadn't been well she would have been right. a, bit, a bit old by then but uh, yes i you know marjorie cameron for prime minister would be would have been an interesting uh, um possibility but yeah um yeah, Pars I think Parsons saw. I think Parsons had a discussion with with Wilfred Smith, and I, I've got it in the play, uh, in which he says these li these lights in the sky they're not necessarily nuts and bolts machines. They're um, they're actually alien. They are entities in themselves. Now, one of the things this, uh, this is a little bit of a sidetrack, but um, let's just explore it. One of the Interesting things about the whole UFO phenomenon is the extraordinary diversity of um, sightings in, the, in terms of the shape and size and color and motion, and the extraordinary diversity in contactee experiences, all the way from you know the benevolent people who greet George Adamski to the unpleasant people that Betty and Barney Hill met, um, right. who conducted medical experiments on them. So. What's going on here? I, I think something very interesting and strange is going on, but I don't think it's necessarily, you know, nuts and bolts metal metal spacecraft. Um, 
it's it, it's there's Jung's idea that um, flying saucers appear in the sky because they respond to our unconscious sort of anxieties and concerns, and we see you know we see ap apocalyptic changes signified in whatever the imagery is of a particular century or a particular culture. So in the 19th century, people see flying ships. And if you go back a bit further in medieval times, they see flying chariots or flying carts or whatever. Right. Uh, um, so I think what, what we have here is a, it's, it's entities which would appear to have some kind of autonomous existence, but they represent themselves using the language and imagery of our our popular culture. Um, and what it all means in the long run, I do not know. I mean, some people have speculated there are actually time travellers from the future. Um, once again, that goes back to the idea of flesh and blood machines. Um, one can also link it with the... Um, the alternate universe idea, which is what I use as, as, as a strand in, in the novels, um, as an ongoing theme, and that they are intruders, visitors, friendly or otherwise, from other planes of existence in a parallel or even a divergent universe. And then the, here we get into the very interesting area where sort of magic and science sort of grope each other in the dark and uh, uh, present us with some very interesting questions. Uh, so that's my take. I, I think that people who report UFO sightings are, by and large, pretty genuine. I think there are a large number that are obviously mistakes, like, you know, mistaken aircraft. And uh, it has been said that the CIA actually encouraged and nurtured uh, the cult of um, ufology and UFOs as a way of uh, distracting people away from, you know, experiments with stealth bombers and uh, other unconventional aircraft. Um, which is another possibility. But even if you eliminate all those, there are certain, there are, there are certain things that um, just do not add up in, in conventional terms. And I think we're seeing a phenomenon that we don't really have a language for. Um, I think the French writer Jacques Vallée, who appeared in a cameo role in Close Encounters, uh, I think his books like Passport to Magonia, um, offer some very interesting insights in this. And I have to say, I'm sorry, I'm branching off here on another of my digressions. I have played around with um, fly, with flying saucers um, in a book I wrote under a pseudonym called Space Virgins of the Third Reich, which is not to be taken entirely seriously. It's an erotic novel, actually, um, about, a, uh, about a young girl who, um, well, she's not that young, she's 19, and she's... Um, She's on a film studies, media studies course, and her lecturer, who's a rather sinister character, gets her to do a project on a film called Space Virgin to the Third Reich, which is a B-movie about Nazi flying saucers. But as the thing unfolds, uh, the B-movie about flying saucers um, corresponds to the, you know, the alleged Nazi experiments with flying saucers, one of which is still buried in the UK to this day. And you can read all about it. Um, Sorry, that's a bit of self-indulgence there, but I did have fun writing Space Virgins of the Third Reich. Could you, uh, I mean, yeah, so, could you tell us a little bit about that? That sounds fascinating. Well, um, the idea was to write, on, was to write, I wrote under pseudonym Saul Wolf because I wanted to keep a separate identity from my more serious books. <laughs> the, idea, the idea was to write something entertaining, sexy, uh, but also had, you know, some strong characters and had a real storyline. So we begin in England in, you know, the present day, and there's sort of Ruth, who's a, who's a very bright young thing, um, who's fascinated by the culture, that the fashion of the movies of the 1950s. And she has this lecturer called, this, uh, lecturer called Mr. Steele. And Mr. Steele is, uh, you know, tall, crew-cut, blonde, Aryan type, um, and uh, he jokingly suggests to Ruth that if she wants to do a, a really A-plus film studies project, she should research Space Virgin to the Third Reich, although he has some doubts as to whether the film was actually ever existed. And Ruth, at first, she can't find anything out about it. And then with the help of her, her equally sexy and voluptuous friends, she meets various people who can help her, like... Um, and she gradually sort of unpeels this narrative. And at the same time, there is this um, British sort of, um, if you like, far sort of, air, sort of pseudo Nazi group um, who also who are also after the film. And uh, as a res and 
steel is initiated with with them by via various peculiar rituals um, of, a, of, a, of an erotic and bizarre nature. Anyway, the whole thing sort of progresses to a climax in many senses of the word. Um, with the discovery of a buried Nazi UFO um, in a disused hangar somewhere in the south of England. Uh, by this time, this has become a political hot potato as well. Um, I won't... Uh, the ending is a little too complicated and maybe a little too... It sounds ridiculous and implausible if you try to summarise it, so I'll leave it there. But yeah, let's save say that for the book. It's a it's a five star romp on Amazon, according to some people. Some of them, you know, a couple of them are friends of mine actually. But uh, there we are. But uh, there's a moral in this. You see, if you try and go commercial, it never works because the books never made me much money. I thought I thought it was going to be my pension, but it, it hasn't. Anyway, to get um to get to get, I think have we anything more about Parsons that 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 uh, that, that you want to look at? I got to tell you, you really put together a, a neat timeline about Parsons. I know a lot more about him now than I did before, and I'm sure our listeners do as well. What a you know, fascinating life and sad indeed what, what he had to go. You know, and then you look at Hubbard, which created the you know Scientology, all the billions of dollars and control that that organization has and Dianetics yeah. and, and just fascinating. And, you know, getting into Scientology, that's a whole other subject, but they, sh they certainly do a good job of keeping people in that organization once they start. Oh, God, up. yes, they do indeed. Um I was. People said I was crazy to write a play with L. Ron Hubbard in it, but I went ahead and did it. Um, I sent. Eventually, I sent the final draft to the BBC. It was a very nice American guy there, a producer called Ned Shia, and Ned said, "This is fascinating, Paul, but um, you know, you've got too many characters and it's too long. So can you do a rewrite?" So I did a rewrite. I did a rewrite, and uh, he said, "Right, um, I think it's ready to go. You know, we're at the final stage." He said, "I like it, but I've got to get the approval of the." Uh, uh, the head of drama and the head of Radio 4. And then they just dropped, and he said, well, we need to get the legal department to look at it too. And then the BBC dropped it like a hot potato. They didn't want to know. And my guess is that they were worried about having even a fictional portrayal of Ron Hubbard, which I felt was ridiculous. Um, it, and when the play... When a stage version of the play was performed for a one that one nighter in London in 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 2005, the, Sci the Scientology office in London was only a few blocks away. Um, people said you're crazy, you know. My, my oldest son was very worried. Dad, you're kind of walking around with a, an armoured waistcoat, you know. But I'm still, <laughs> but I'm still here. And of course, you know that there are there elite, there's a guy called. Oh God, I've forgotten his name. There was an American guy, a nice bloke who lives who lives in Pasadena, whose mother worked on various rocket projects at JPL, but I don't think with Parsons. And he's written a book. He's written a play called Pasadena Babylon, but the emphasis there is on the rocket train. I think the occult thing is sort of you know treated for comedy, really. Um, there's a guy called um, there's an Irish guy who's who's written quite an interesting play about. Uh, about Crowley and Parsons, but it's, as far as I know, I've lost contact with him now. It's never been produced. Now, with your, with your play that you put together, I mean, do you have it set up to where different theaters across the country or globe might have an opportunity to do it? Well, we've had an inquiry. Uh, my publisher had an inquiry from a theater group in Phoenix, and I replied to them and said, yes, I'm interested, but that's gone dead at the moment. I haven't heard for several weeks, so that, that may fizzle out. Um, as always, it's just a question of getting you know um, time and money and, and support. I'm hoping the publication of this book will attract interest, as it has. It's evidenced by the fact that the guys in Phoenix got in touch with me and that I'm talking to you right now. But cinematically... Um, the Sex and Rockets book was optioned by Don Murphy, who is a big name in Hollywood. He did Transformers and all sorts of stuff. And he was very keen to do it. And a, fr a friend of mine wrote, uh, emailed Murphy and said, well, there are, I know two guys, one of them being me, one of them being the Irish guy. Uh, I, I know two you know, really bright guys who'd, who've written plays about uh, about Parsons and Crowley, and they, they do a great screenplay and he immediately got a, a furious fax back from Murphy saying um, you touch this and I will sue you until you <laughs> uh, so having said that I think uh, Don Murphy has run into the sort of Hollywood um, Scientology um, phenomenon you know because so many prominent Hollywood figures are Scientologists right. the, the irony is that John Travolta will be a fantastic Ron he'd do it really well um, Johnny Depp will be a will be a great Parsons, 
Um, yeah. You know, but I don't see that happening. Now, having said that, there's another, I think, just retract. Yeah, having said that, I don't think Murphy's going to go ahead, although he's still got the option on the book because he is keen to do it. I don't know what he make of it. But in the meantime, something else has happened because the other book on Parsons, the George Pendle book, has been optioned um, by Ridley Scott. And one of Ridley Scott's people is supposed to be making a television series. Uh, I think the emphasis is going to be more on the rockets. The magic obviously has to come into it. Maybe Ron will come into it peripherally. Um, now, Ridley Scott is a serious guy who I respect. And if he's producing it, I think we may see something good. I did, of course, email Ridley Scott's London office, but they never replied, you know, uh, as I'm not on the, you know, I'm not a member of the, the magic Hollywood the circle. Grove. <laughs> the Beam Grove. The Grove. Yeah, I don't know what you have to join, the skull and bones. Um, anyway, um, so that's where we stand. I think we're going to see more about Parsons. I, the, Ridley Scott, uh, the Ridley Scott is supposed to be a TV miniseries. Um so where and where, where and how that will surface, I don't know. Uh, I'd certainly like to have another crack at doing Babel, and I'd like to rewrite it, actually. You I know, think it, I, I'm sorry to interrupt here. I'm just my mind's going a million miles an hour. It would be fascinating to see, you know, what your work, you know, put put a miniseries together and put it on the sci fi channel. Uh, I re the sci fi channel recently had this amazing three part series called Childhood's End, which is based on the old book, oh. Arthur C. Clarke. Oh, that's a great book. I love that book. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, I haven't read the book. I, I'm going to now. That three part series blew my mind. It was absolutely incredible the way that they integrated um, this, you know, extraterrestrial race coming down to Earth. And then the ETs look just like what most Christians would consider the devil. You know, they had horns and stuff like that. But that's Right, yeah. But just the whole concept and the way that they integrated science and, and religion and revelations and everything else. And, and I'm not a religious person at all. I'm, I'm very neutral in that regard. But it was just neat to see everything put together. And, yeah, I would love to see the, the Babylon and, and some of the, the plays that you've put together in a series on, on something like the Sci-Fi Channel. And I, I tell you, I think it would do really good, Paul, because people are interested in that kind of stuff right now. They're a lot more open to those things. And, mm. and the fringe type aspects and the occult and the unknown is really getting to be mainstream. So if you could find a way to, to kind of, I guess, come up with an alias for Hubbard so you didn't have to piss off all those Scientology <laughs> guys or something, man, that'd be awesome. Yes. It's yes, probably what would we, what we call them. Um, anyway, anyway that's, a, that's a digression. Yeah, that, that would be lovely, Rex. Um, I'm working on it. I mean, I did. I have been through various agents. The, the sort of literary world in the UK is very sort of rocky at the moment. Um, I had one very good agent a few years ago, and then she went off and had a family, and then she switched entirely to doing um, doing other kind of stuff. I had another agent who was um, going to do my first novel, The Clip Off, and was very excited about it. And then we didn't get anywhere because the guy who liked it had been made redundant. And eventually my agent gave up agenting and went off and became a psychotherapist, probably through you know, talking to so many frustrated authors. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, yeah. Uh, sorry, where were we? Give me, a, give me a lead. Sure. We were talking about, you know, the possibility of getting on to sci-fi or something like that and some of the problems mm. that you've gone through. Another thing I was, you know, for those that are listening to the broadcast, please check out Paul's work. You can go to scarletimprint.com and Paul's got an entire section there. And so I, I think it would be neat also with the, the plays that you do. Let me ask you, Paul, do you actually make them as realistic as possible when the characters perform some rituals? I, I, maybe not obviously the sexual ones, but, you know, whatever. I don't know. Maybe it is a, a, a more of a well, exotic. Well, in, in the case of the Babylon play, we had an enormous advantage. After the, um, after the failure of the a play with the BBC, um, I mentioned it to somebody I know who runs this wonderful occult bookshop in London called Treadwells in the Bloomsbury area, run by a very charismatic lady called Christina Oakley Harrington. And um, I mentioned this to Christina. I said, well, I've got this play. And she said, we're going to do it, without <laughs> having even read it or seen it. And to cut a long story, she found me a young Canadian director, a very bright woman called Alison Rockbrand, um, who has a group called Travesty Theatre. And they said, right, well, Paul, if you can, you know, pay for the hire of the venue, um, we'll, uh, we'll do it. And a lot of them were, were heavily into the occult, were practicing occultists, and they rehearsed the, and I, I 
I was in, at that time I was living in Hereford, which is quite a distance from London. So I wasn't there for the rehearsals. And when I turned up for the final rehearsal just before the performance, I was absolutely blown away by the way they they they'd done the Enochian chanting. Um, it was very very powerful. And um, if you go to uh, if you go onto YouTube and you type in QB Soul, that's my channel. And there are various things on it, including an old rock and roll band I used to perform with in the 70s. Um, uh, but there's also the audio of the 2005 performance with a kind of slideshow I've put together, including some of the, including some of the Im images, the images that I sent you actually are, are, a, sample, are a sample from that. Um, so I was very, very lucky. I had people who were, who were totally um, open to the concepts in the play uh who were totally committed to giving it you know the best possible performance obviously with the rituals i given given the limitations of the medium you have to condense things i mean parsons rituals went on for hours and hours um and so i just had to do little um condensations of that and you know uh, flashbacks flash forwards um montages or collages really uh, but yes, I was very keen to get the detail right. Uh, the chronology, as I said before, is a bit suspect, partly because I didn't have all the information, partly because we still don't have all the information, and partly because I was you know, I was writing a play um, which had to, you know, fit a, a certain certain time length. Um, I mean, you know, if, I suppose if you know, you could write a play about Parsons that lasted for sort of fourteen hours or something, if you included all the rituals. But um, I don't know whether anybody would survive, whether the audience would survive it. So yes, <laughs> right. you know, so you know, the so yes, it's important for me to get the to get the details right, the atmosphere right, and the feeling right, and to take the subject seriously, um, which I think it absolutely demands it. Yeah. So looking at. Again, look, looking at the plays, um, the first play I, did, I, I had broadcast back in 72 in Canada was, again, it relates, I think, to some of the interest of your listeners because it was about dream control. It was called The Dream Laboratory. And uh, the inspiration for this came from what I'd read about dream laboratory experiments in the States, particularly at the Maimonides Laboratory and the work that Charles Honiton was doing um, relating dream experiences to telepathic experiences. And so I wrote this play. It was heavily influenced by Marshall McLuhan and Burroughs and so on. And uh, it's, the form, it's in the form of a mock documentary in which two reporters go to investigate the, um, the work of the dream laboratory and eventually become subjects themselves. And what is actually happening is that their dreams are being invaded and manipulated and then sort of erased or negated as a, as a, as a system of social control. Um, so that becomes a metaphor for the media at large. And there were lots of collages of media fragments in there, of bits of you know TV commercials and Vietnam War reported and, and so on. And, and, and some of the uh, and it becomes the language becomes very very surrealist um, as they describe to their as the subjects des describe to their audience to the audience what they're actually experiencing and then they become increasingly disturbed as the director of the laboratory tries to control and manipulate them so that that interest was there from the beginning i suppose um but the next thing that i had broadcast which was again uh, it, 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 was not, it was a strange encounter with the BBC, but it was broadcast, which was one of the strangest things about it. Have you, have you, you or your listeners ever read a book called The Morning of the Magicians by Pavel Zimbergier? Also came out as The Dawn of Magic. I have um, heard it. Right. It was, a, it was a bestseller in the 60s. And there was one phrase in it. It was about, about, um, it was about the occult Nazi uh, phenomenon, and there was a phrase in it that um, senior Nazis would meet in the vault of Babelsberg Castle to conduct the ritual of the stifling air. Well, I didn't know what the ritual of the stifling air was, but it was a very resonant phrase, and it triggered lots of things. And I was wasn't in the best of spaces at that time um, for for a whole welter of reasons I, I, that I don't, we don't need to go into at this this point, and. 
the idea of writing a play in which Nazi necromant neo not British neo Nazi necromancers attempt to raise the spirit of the, the Führer in a séance was very very was very compelling. I, so I just had to do it, and I did it. So it's quite short. It's about twenty five minutes. It's really like an extended poem. It is just a little introduction, and there's the, there's the ceremony, and that's it. Uh, and in the end, the Führer does come through, but not quite in the way that they're expecting. Um, I sent this to the BBC. I actually sent it to a poet that I knew in the poetry department, a guy called George Macbeth, who's sadly now dead. And George, in those days, the BBC was, you know, if somebody really liked what you did, then they'd ask one other person about it and it would get done. You didn't have to go through dozens and dozens of committees like you do now. And uh, George Macbeth liked this and he passed it on to somebody else and uh, crazily enough they decided to do it and it took a long while it took a year or so before it actually got recorded with my friend vincent supplying the music on piano and hammond organ um i wasn't there for the recording session and the bbc made a lot of this in the publicity about the play uh what follows allegedly the actors and the, and the technicians became increasingly disturbed by curious noises and inexplicable breakdowns of equipment and curious sounds in the talkback and in the in, in the foldback in, in in the studio and also in the control room. Now, I've having worked having done worked as a freelance broadcaster and also having you know performed in bands. I'm well aware of all the things that can go wrong in a recording studio and how you can get feedback and static and you can signal flow can go all wrong and so on. But these were experienced engineers and an experienced producer, and so were the actors, you know. And apparently they were really quite disturbed by this. Um, anyway, the play eventually did go out. Everybody hated it except, except the guy from The Observer who said it was very powerful. And I think it was, and it was, a, I suppose, a kind of catharsis for me to write it. Um, but I noticed the BBC, although they quite often recycle old drama performances, um, even going far back as the 60s and 70s, they've never recycled that on there. There is a channel devoted to called Radio 4 Extra where they you know, recycle things. I should explain for your listeners that in the UK, radio drama is still quite a big thing. I mean, in the States, I think you only get it now on NPR or a few local, st or a few local stations. But here it's still quite big because it's a relatively cheap medium and it's very flexible. And, you know, you can have a laboratory explosion um, or... Um, necromantic nazi ceremony um and you don't have to pay for the costumes or the special effects right. it's all that it's all there in the writing and the acting so anyway so i then what happened then there's a play which i didn't include in here because it it, it is off topic it's about my involvement in sort of punk rock and so on um back in the day but there are others in there which i think relate to your interest i mean there's the graham bond play and there's yeah, there's a play about the electronic voice phenomenon. Um, I'm sure, again, your listeners are familiar with this and um, EVP. Oh, yeah. Is, yeah. EV, yeah. EVP is very frustrating. I've never really got anywhere with it, despite having owned numerous old tape recorders. Um, yeah, I wrote a play which eventually came out in Ireland about a guy trying to contact um, a man of you know, advance, advancing years, um, like myself, trying to contact the spirit of his dead girlfriend, whom actually he, whose death he's actually been responsible for, although that is something that he has repressed. And it begins in quite a comic way. You know, this elderly, slightly eccentric man, you know, talking into his tape recorder, and then his equally eccentric sister coming in and interrupting him and arguing with him and so on, and eventually agreeing to help him. And then it gets steadily darker as... Uh, he hears her voice. She can't hear it. The listeners can hear it, but she can't, and he can. Uh, and the play ends with a, an enigma. You know, what has he heard? Uh, his sister tries to persuade him that, you know, it's all been a delusion or a technical fault with equipment. So uh, I was quite pleased with the way the, uh, the voice collection came out. Actually, the, again, I wasn't directly involved in the production at all. The producer did a brilliant job great actors and very subtle understated sound effects it's, it's really nice um the, 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 going back to Alistair Crowley again one of the and going back to my father's interest in esoteric matters one of the people my father corresponded with before the war and after the war was a man who has been the who is uh, 
frequently mentioned in connection with witchcraft, usually in a rather derisory way because of his very eccentric take on it. And that was Father Montague Aloysius Summers, who may or may not have been a Catholic, a, a Catholic priest. Some people say he was bogus, who wrote an, a series of enormous books in the 1920s and 30s about witchcraft, about werewolves, about vampires, um, the werewolf, his kith and kin, uh, was one of his titles, witchcraft in Europe. And, uh, Summers believed fervently everything that he read in medieval accounts of um, in, of uh, witchcraft trials, and the Inquisition was always right, and the witches were always wrong, and the Inquisition was doing a thoroughly good job of, um, and the various witch finders again they they were they were doing a very important job in saving us from the horrors and terrors of witchcraft, which he said in a letter to my father, you can still find in our great cities today. So there was an extraordinary man of Summers who um, was a sort of possibly a bogus priest who wrote um, copiously about magic and witchcraft. He also wrote about um, he was an expert on restoration, seventeenth century, eighteenth century theatre as well. He wrote about that. Uh, and the Gothic novel, he wrote about the Gothic novel. The thing about Summers was that it's emerged through more recent writings and biographies uh, that he actually had a bit of a double life, that he'd known Crowley and actually sort of got on quite well with him. They chatted together quite cheerfully. Um, and that Summers had also been involved in, in the Edwardian era and in the 1890s, in, in sorry, in the, during the First World War period, on Boxing Day 1918, in a black mass, uh, which was uh, celebrated with the aid of a friend of his and a rent boy from Piccadilly, because Summers, Summers was a repressed gay. Um, and it just struck me that this, uh, I took as a starting point for the play the fact that Summers is now elderly, he's with his, uh, sitting in his little house in Richmond, and he reads... Crowley's obituary in the paper and he's terrified and he's afraid that all this is going to come out so he starts to try and write his own account of what happens but the reality of what happened keeps breaking through and there are flashbacks to his meetings with Crowley um, and there's and one of the characters who've been involved in his sort of dubious cavortings in Edwardian times pops up again and starts nagging him and blackmailing him and if, and there's a woman he knows who believes that she's been possessed by Crowley and he goes along to exorcise her um, and eventually re and it's really it's really Summers coming coming to terms with himself as as, Cro as Crowley said if at one point in the going back to this true will thing Crowley says your he doesn't I'm paraphrasing it slightly but he more or less says your true true will was not to be a priest but to be, a, to be an actor and your true your destiny was to be gay and you would as a gay actor you would have been very fulfilled um but you chose to repress and sublimate and complicate all this and now you're you know you're torturing this poor woman with this this exorcism nonsense um and anyway the thing eventually segues into in, into into summer's death having i think accepted some of the truths about about himself so um yeah so there, there are these sort of occult um, strands that, that run through the plays. It's the same thing with the books. Um, do you want to talk about the novels for a bit? You know, that'd be great. And before we get into the novels, I was just going to ask you a couple of questions because you brought up Dream Control and the Dream Laboratory play that you put together. Are you personally able to have an out-of-body experience? Can you astral project? I've had... I, I wouldn't say I was... Um, Trying to think, I've had quite very intense lucid dreams, but not astral projections per se. No, I think I'd be uh, I'd be overstating the case. I haven't had the phenomenon whereby you feel you're observing yourself. I know people who have had, uh, and I also I also know someone who's seen seen a very convincing UFO. Just going back to UFOs for a moment, uh, but I I haven't actually. Uh, I have tr I have tried, um, you know, but. Uh, Lucid dreaming, yes. I mean, I get a lot of idea, ideas and characters and scenarios from dreams. Um, nice. Things usually begin, you know, very often, you know, a fragmentary phrase. The, tr the, the recurrent dream, though, apart from the recurrent dream of being a teacher and not knowing what I'm doing because I used to teach for a living at one point, uh, is of I'm reading this, I've got this 
TypeScript in front of me of this fantastic book that I've written, and it's really wonderful. It's going to be absolutely fantastic. And then I, but I can't read a word in it. It's, you know, the typography is all strange. I can't read it. And then I wake up, and I always feel, you know, that's the book that, that's got away. But I've got to catch up with it one of these days. But does that answer your astral projection question? Yeah, absolutely. That's that's great. And another thing too, I wanted to ask, and then I'd love to get into some of the novels you've put together. Um, is the Enochian calls? Have you yourself had a, a experience doing these Enochian rituals and calls? Um, well, the nearest I've been to a fully fledged Enochian ritual was actually in Babylon when the when they performed the Enochian calls in chorus, and that was very very powerful. Um, I can't quite describe how, but um, the audience, which up to this point, you know, there were quite a few jokes and things, you know, Crowley says various sort of various witticisms and uh, and so on. And, uh, you know, the audience at this point, which would be, which would be you know, enjoying the, the old laugh, grew very, very silent. And there was a sense of tremendous tension. And a couple of the actors said that in the during the rehearsals, the Enochian calls had 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 produced this sense of tension at some point, unease at some point, unease for some and excitement for others, which is interesting. Um, one of one of my actresses claimed that um, as a result of performing Babylon, we were it was somehow connected with a large explosion that took place over the same time period at a, at a petrol refinery near London. Um, and she said it was afterwards, but I did check back and found out that it was before. So, um, which is a bit <laughs> disappointing if you're looking for meaningful coincidences. But uh, now Arlene, who played Babylon, was absolutely convinced for a while that somehow we caused the Buntsfield oil terminal explosion, which, which mercifully nobody was killed, although it was extremely destructive. But no, we ha I don't think we had um, any more than we caused Cameron to take charge. Well, I hope we didn't anyway. Uh, so there's right. your... Uh, so, so, so there's your answer. You know, sure. as I say, I'm a I'm a scribe, really, Rex. Right. Um, right. I'm I'm you know I'm as I said before, I I know great sort of magus or guru or anything. I'm a guy who writes things down. Um, sometimes, you know, a lot of writing is just is slog, right? It's slog and it's repetition. It's writing and it's rewriting. It's rewriting. Take that bit out, put that back in again, and so on. But there are moments when you're just driven. You know, you're in the groove, you're in the channel, you're in the zone. And um, for me, that is the magic moment when the visualization of these actions becomes, uh, of these scenes and these people becomes very, very, very vivid. Um, I don't want to make too much of that, you know. I don't, when my first novel came out, one guy suggested that I should um, preface it as saying that I it had been channeled from Crowley and I said no that is not a good idea the OTO is not going to like that right <laughs> and uh, so uh, no but uh, I think that I think the writing process is a magical process I mean Burroughs Burroughs used to um, often commented on the things that would emerge in his cut-ups which often related to incidents that were going that were either in the news or things that were going up going on around him and he said, and this is something I've learned as I, I, I've got older, that it's all about keeping alert and try, just sort of watching in the moment what's going on around you and inside you. Uh, it's, and it seems very, sim seems very sort of simple and banal to say that, but it's actually quite difficult to do. But if you can do that, then I find it releases a lot of energy, uh, a lot of ideas and, and, and energy which eventually, find, which eventually find their way into, wor into words. So now, you actually you put that together so eloquently and, and I like how you describe yourself as being a scribe because, you know, you're not actually performing rituals and, and joining all these fraternities and, and getting higher ranks because of the, you know, performances and the ritualistic practices, dogmatic, etc. But you have a way of of putting it in a play or in writing to where you, you can call it fiction or whatever, but it really describes so well possibly you know the scenarios and the past of these just remarkable characters that seem to have so much influence in, in people's lives uh, covertly and you know right in front of them so it's it's fa it's fascinating the way that you're, you're describing this and I really appreciate that so the the two well, that books that you have put together the or actually more than that but I'm looking at two of them right now the the polyverse the, yeah that's the most recent one okay that's and a great cover, that, by the way. It's got the chaos magic symbol on the front of it with some neat That's right, there. yes. It, it's, um, there's a chaos magic symbol on it. And if you look closely, you'll also see there's some digital code 
because it's in in a way it's it's an occult cyberpunk novel, as are they all to some extent. Um, might make sense if I went back to the beginning. Great. Um, my first book, my first novel was called The Clip Off, based on which is a title has always bewildered people, um, except those who are interested in esoteric matters. Uh, the Clip Off, as I'm sure you and many of your listeners know, are the if you like, the forces of chaos and destruction, which according to ancient Jewish teaching were released during the process of creation. They're kind of leftover bits and pieces um, for sort of random forces in the universe that cause chaos and upset uh, and confusion. And yet at another level, they are also necessary as an agent of change. And the clip-off um, is... Re- in the clip off, I really took two things and tried to fuse them together, um, and at the same time have it in a totally contemporary, more or less contemporary setting. There was there's the alternate universes idea, which is a staple of science fiction now. The idea that you can that you know one electron away from us is a, another universe in which Paul Green never existed, or you know Paul Green was you know. Uh, a totally um, took a totally different career path and became a famous astronaut or something. I think that's very unlikely. Um, you know that that that's a fairly standard concept. And um, what I tried to do is to take the the idea of the multi leveled universe and fuse that with the idea of the multi leveled esoteric universe that you get in the Kabbalah, where you have the various sephiroth or zones of power with uh, Malkuth the everyday common sense world at the bottom and Kether, the sort of unknowable godhead at the top and en route you have um, Yesod, which is the sphere of sexuality, you have Hod, which is the sphere of uh, communication and reasoning and um, and, and you have uh, Gifura, which is the you know which is related to Mars and to and to force and power and so, and so on and so forth and swirling around that and you have the abyss in the middle, and swirling around that, you you have the, these random clipothic forces on the reverse side of the tree of life, in what Kenneth Grant calls the tunnels of Set, relating it back to to Egypt and e- Egyptology, and Set as the dark god. Um, so we begin with the young man who's who's a, a dropout, whose father is in a mental hospital. Um, where he's friends with another mental patient who's an old rock musician. Uh, and he's, he's, he's got a mother who he's very close to, but who's, who is also, but who's absolutely materialistic. She's a confirmed, you know, she's Marxist, Marxist-Leninist, uh, dialectical materialism. Um, the world is based on economics. Um, and he goes off in search of his father to, the, uh, to, to meet him in the mental hospital. But he doesn't get there because he ends up in a strange alternate world, um, which in, in which magical organisations and mystical organisations are all sort of battling with each other. And uh, but it's a world which is very kind of it, it, instead of being uh, uh, some kind of um, you know earthly paradise, it's rather like a seedy British seaside town. It's actually based on Torquay, where I used to live in Devon, and. Um, it's full of you know curious rivalries, and he goes to a kind of magical college. And I wrote this long before I came up with this idea long before Harry Potter. Um, Harry Potter, it isn't. The only similarity is that he goes and he gets some magical training, uh, and he falls in love, and he falls in love with, with, with two women. One of them, Layla, is if you like the is perhaps closer to the the archetypal Scarlet Woman. The other one, Robin, is maybe closer to I suppose in Greek terms she'd be sort of Athena. She would be a a quieter representation of femininity i don't know and um it emerges that a, sort of a sinister entrepreneur is going to is, is working on a technology that will link the two uh, zones both the the everyday world and this sort of hypothetical alternate world and this releases tremendous ap- apocalyptic destruction so by the time you get to the second book beneath the pleasure zones my, my character is a bit older now and England is in a state of total meltdown and collapse, you know, socially, economically, in every possible way. Um, the cities are dominated 
in the cities, most people are locked into some virtual reality, um, dream control experiences, which are constructed from the remnants of old video games and old adult movies. Um, in the in the countryside, you've got sort of little little pagan sort of communities and communes and covert. Co who are trying to be self-supporting. All around them, you've got a battle going on between the heavy shepherds, who are like sort of Christian fundamentalists with with um, machine guns and um, and uh, transporters, and they're fighting with the Mo boys. I think you can guess who they are. Um, who are rather like our friends currently, uh, or, or not friends, as the case may be, in in Iraq and and Syria. In other words, they're sort of a Daesh, Daesh or ISIS type mm -hmm. uh, militant group. So you've got the so you've got the fundamentalist Christians and and and, and, and the fundamentalist Muslims all beating hell out of each other. And in, in the middle of this, people are trying to survive. And this is and this scenario continues on to the final book, the Polyverse, where. So I mean the whole thing is it's a kind of coming of age story in a way because he's in the he's in the, he's a little bit older in the final book, and the phenomena around him are getting stranger and stranger as the polyverse starts to unravel, and cause and effect start breaking down. Your scientific cause and effect just start breaking down, and what I try to posit would we'll be living in a. Um, that living in a magical universe wasn't necessarily living in a landscape of you know swords and sorceries and dragons and you know games of thrones and all that stuff. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that, you know. I raised my hat to that in passing, but um, it was in a world where you know you had a com you might have a computer, but it never quite worked because it constantly changed what you were writing as you went along. And I'm not thinking of spell correction either, um, where you couldn't rely on a science. If you tried to carry out a scientific experiment, and I think at one point the hero actually is talking about rockets as, a, as an example of this, uh, you can never guarantee that the what you're studying will behave the same way twice. So the whole idea of a repeatable experiment goes out of the window. And as a result, in the World Wide Web morphs into something called the lobe, which is a far more unpredictable electronic network in which uh, electronic entities are actually... Uh, become autonomous and mischievous like sort of gigantic digital poltergeists and they take the form of the quantum brothers they usually present themselves not as you know monsters with two heads but as rather respectable looking businessmen and they keep popping up all the time um, and the quantum brothers have got their own agenda uh, uh, for the future of the UK and for that matter for the future of the earth uh, and the obviously the Mo boys and the Heavy shepherds have got their their religious agendas, and in the middle and in the middle of this, the the pagans are trying to, trying to find a way through to try to resolve this. And uh, it, this is not one of these scenarios where my hero saves the world, but at the end there is there are signs of hope. Um, you know, there's death and destruction, and you know things, and there are there's a lot of violence, uh, and. There's, you know, a fair bit of, se of of sexual adventure as well, both whether it's in the virtual reality zone or whether it's um, in the the world of the Nor, if you like. So, uh, so the poly in the polyverse, everything is polymorphous and perverse. You know, you cannot trust thing. You you know, you cannot trust any technology to behave, and you're not sure what's real and what is, you know, and what is fantasized. Now, these are not new ideas themselves but i just think i've done something rather different with them by placing them in, again very much in a in an everyday britain which has been totally subverted and distorted and morphed um so there it's a sort of not quite a disaster novel, if you know what i mean it's almost but there is hope at the end and possibly there will be a sequel we shall see well it certainly is a, a marathon of synapses in my mind just shooting right now because you're so multi-leveled with these plays and writings that you put together it certainly just creates a an entire new concept of imaginary possibilities I, I think it's fascinating so definitely exercise for the mind and and the soul um, now you've got a YouTube channel an excellent YouTube channel um, so folks go to Paul Green Babylon and YouTube just type that in his YouTube channel will pull up also you're on scarletimprint.com I'm uh, also uh, and I'm also for the novels I'm on libroslibertad.ca for the clip off 
And you can also get that on Amazon. I think now you can, it's out of print in the UK, yes, but I think you can get it electronically anyway from, uh, from Amazon. And if you go to uh, Mandrake, Man, if, you go to, if you type in Mandrake of Oxford, you will get the publishers of the other two novels who also do a lot of interesting paranormal and occult books founded by a guy called Mog Morgan, uh, along with um, Scarlet Imprint. It's one of the, you know, I'd say, you know, ground leading uh, occult and alternative presses. Uh, in, in in the UK, and Mog, Mog does some interesting stuff. He covers a whole range of, he covers paganism, he covers um, traditional witchcraft, he covers the paranormal, um, and you know he does some fiction as well. He does fiction which relates to these themes. So uh, you know I, I think you find something interesting there. And as for Scarlet Imprint, of course, um, you know I've got to put in a plug for my publishers. They do some wonderful books. You can either buy. They do beautifully produced. Um, hardbacks but they also do um very nice high quality paperback editions of them as well so do look at scarlet imprint well uh, I, I certainly and, hope that somebody out there that has a lot of money in the media has an opportunity to listen to this broadcast and maybe they'll give you a call and you can send them some of your plays and they can turn them into mini series because just really cool concepts man i gotta tell you well that's that's very generous of, of you rex i mean i'm not the i'm not the only person to to explore these areas. Well, I do think I put my own twist to them. Um, and I've put in a certain amount of commitment in terms of time and energy. And as I say, I've have tried to engage with them imaginatively as, as, as fully as I can. So there you have it. How do you want to, how do you want to wind things up? Well, I just would like to say once again, I uh, really appreciate you spending some time with us here and hopefully we'll have the opportunity to speak with you again sometime. That will be fun, Rex. I've really enjoyed that. Th thank you for being such a patient listener to my, my various uh, diversions, digressions and devolutions. Um, it's, be it's been a lot of fun. So you look after yourself. Whereabouts are you, by the way, geographically? Well, uh, I am out here in San Antonio, Texas right now and uh, just enjoying the nice weather today. It's a little bit cool. Yesterday it was almost 80 degrees. So, <laughs> All right. All right. Oh, it's, pretty cool. it's been pretty cold down here in Hastings, bright but cold. And it's night and uh, night's fallen. And... Um, i just like to wish you all the best, and I should be following the channel with great interest, and, um, you know, you take care of yourself. You too, Paul. You take care of yourself. We'll talk to you again. You have a good one. Take care. Bye. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Rex Bear with Leak Project. Tonight we have guest Paul A. Green, philosopher, author, screenwriter, occultist. Paul grew up in London and studied at Oxford and the University of British Columbia. Magical techniques are central to Mr. Green's writing practice, which is ultimately an exploratory process. Thus his pursuit of the arcana of magic and the enigmas of esoterica is amplified not only in Babylon and other plays, but in poetry, as in his collection, Shearsman 2012, The Gospel Bunker, and in such novels as the Clip-Off, Libros Libertad, and Beneath the Pleasure Zones, Mandrake of Oxford 2014, he has made radio documentaries on aspects of the occult and paranormal, featuring Colin Wilson, Francis X. King, Ian Sinclair, among others, while the plays have been broadcast on BBC Radio, CBC Canada, RTE Ireland, and Resonance FM, all have been staged by Travesty Theatre and New Theatre Works. He has performed or presented at many venues, most recently at the Final Academy, Magic Art Bristol, the Moot with no name, the Electric Palace Hastings, and St. Augustine's Tower in Hackney. He has especially enjoyed collaborations, whether with musicians like the late Vincent Crane, or with the artist Jeremy Welsh, creating video poems like The Slow Learner and Radial City. Mr. Green now lives in Hastings. It's great to have you on the show tonight with us here at The Leak Project. Paul, how are you doing? I'm, I'm doing very well, thanks, Rex. And it's, um, it's a pleasure to be, to be invited. Um, I'm actually in Hastings, which is about 50 miles from London, um, in the town where Alistair Crowley died in, 19, in 1947. So there's a sort of occult connection, if you like, in the, in, in the actual location I'm situated with. Well, that's not the reason I necessarily moved here. But there are sort of Alistair Crowley 
landmarks in Hastings. The house where he lived was demolished many years ago, um, but there are still places around town where he used to hang out. And, you know, I like to think his spirit sort of hovers vaguely in the background somewhere. Was he buried out there as well? No, he was. Um, it's a strange story. Um, he died in 47. He was cremated in Brighton. And then the ashes went to America to Carl uh, Germer, one of his disciples, who apparently buried them under a tree. And then Germer sort of forgot that where they were buried. And I think somebody, and there's a possibility that they got lost or scattered or dug up or something. So they, you know, they, they disappeared upon the wind, I think. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, Hastings. Hastings is, is a good place to be. There's a lot of um, cultural activity going along here, and lots of music and lots of writers. So um, you know, I feel I feel quite at home here. Sure, and I know the UK is very the culture out there. There's been hermetics and the occult and mysticism for just thousands of years out there, and it's it's very fascinating. What really got you into the occult, Paul? Well, it's a, it's a curious thing. Um, I was educated as a Roman Catholic. My father was a Catholic, and outwardly he was a very conventional man. But he had this, you know, there were strange books that he would purchase, sometimes for the bewilderment of my mother. And so at so quite, a, quite a young age, I would read, uh, oh, A.E. Waite's books on, uh, on ceremonial magic and uh, Simmons, the Simmons biography of Crowley and, and so on and so forth. And this kind of... I. I pursued this um, at various levels, not too seriously at first. And then when I was, I was in Canada in the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, and I was sort of seeing myself through grad school by doing some um, freelance broadcasting. And I suggested a program about Alistair Crowley and magic to a CBC producer I knew. And he said, oh, go for that. So I started doing a lot more reading and research. And... I'm not a joiner. I've never really been a member of a particular order. There are certain sort of processes and practices I've investigated. Um, but to me, the real magical act is the act of writing, um, partly because of the techniques that I've, that I've used. I mean, things that are common to other writers, like, you know, sort of automatic writing that surrealists use, um, cut-ups like William Burroughs used. Burroughs, incidentally, has got a very strong occult strain in his work. There's a particularly good book I'd recommend written by a friend of mine actually called um, The Magical Universe of William Burroughs. But that's an aside. There, so there are certain sort of procedures uh, I got interested in at some points in sigil magic. Um, and the, there were certain things that one experimented with as a, uh, as a writer. I've always felt that Writing is a magical act. You create mental pictures. You create, hopefully, you create sort of little archetypes that will resonate in other people's mental spaces. Um, but I'm, you know, I don't make any claims to be a great magus or anything. I've always seen myself as a scribe, um, insofar as I have any formal religious beliefs at all. Now, I do identify quite a bit with the Egyptian god Thoth, who was the god of magic, the god of writing, um, he, who compares pretty well to the sort of Jehovah, whereas Je the biblical Jehovah sends plagues and destruction and slays the firstborn. You know, Thoth, you know, teaches the Egyptian writing and magic and all sorts of, you know, skills. Um, so I think as a deity, he's pretty good. But um, I'm, drif I'm, I'm drifting here. Well, let, I'm Rick, so ask, ask me a question. I'm really glad you brought up Thoth because that's that's a perfect uh, segue there. I've always been fascinated with Thoth as well. And do you think that the emerald tablets of Thoth are legit or do you think that that's something that was kind of made up? Well, I think the whole sort of Thoth Hermit Trismegistus thing evolved over a long, over quite a long period of time. Some people have argued that that, that the, the hermetic texts were actually written in the early sort of post-Christian era and second or third centuries. Others, others claim that there's a much f further connection back as to whether the, as whether the, ab sorry, the emerald tablet uh, exists in any physical form now, I don't know. And I suppose I have my doubts, but as to the basic concept of as above, so below, um, as William Butler put it, as the great Smaragdine tablet said, um, then I think uh, you know it's a it's an it's a useful concept. Let me put it like that. Well, there's a lot in the. Have you read the actual texts? Yes, I have. Yes, I mean the, the text. The texts are very resonant, I think, and uh, 
but as as to what as to whether we can link, how far we can link them back to the Egyptian god Thoth, I don't know. Not being uh, an Egyptologist, are you familiar with uh, the majority or some of the, I guess you could say, higher archetype gods of Egypt, ancient Egypt? Uh, well, obviously through reading re reading Crowley um, and reading uh, the Book of the Law, uh, one encounters Horus, the Nuit, and and Set, uh, to name three three principal principal figures and uh, I think that the that again as archetypes they are you know psychologically very powerful and, and, and very resonant do you think that they were real I mean uh, real people at one time or actual gods that came down from the heavens well once again another op another open question um, to some extent all right they could be based on powerful or influential individuals in the prehistory of Egypt or the prehistory of other societies. Uh, they could be based on some kind of external or alien intervention in the past. To, um, to some extent, they could be entities who exist because we have imagined them. Um, I don't, are you familiar with the work of the British uh, chaos magician Peter Carroll? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Peter. Yeah. Absolutely. Great guy. Yeah. Great, yeah. I mean, I think he's the most interesting and important writer on uh, on, on the occult since, since Crowley, and I've you know done one of his Arcanorium online studies. Uh, what was that well. like? Uh, it was fascinating. The thing that interested me most of all that most of the correspondents uh, on uh, on the Arcanorium College uh, were terrifyingly intelligent physicists. And, you know, I was soon struggling to keep up with their, their mathematics um, because my background is in English and the, and the humanities rather than physics and maths. And actually, the paradox is that the sciences are actually seem to be quite good training for magicians, you know, referencing, you know, Crowley's study of chemistry at Cambridge. Um, yeah, that was that was very, that was very stimulating. And I think that um, I think that Carol's created a, you know, a new paradigm, really. Um, one that's more open-ended, less less hierarchical, um, more fluid, uh, and I found it throughout the certainly throughout the novels, uh, the idea of a chaotic universe in which a multiplicity of entities evolved in a way as a kind of mirror image of our interaction with them. I, I think that's fascinating. I, I don't know if I've explained that terribly well because it's, it's a concept that is difficult to grasp. Uh, but I think that Carol is uh, Carol's a key figure, no doubt about it. Now, the chaos magic is uh, an incredible form of, you know, different modules to achieve results. Um, you know, I've talked to several people like Andrea Vitimus on chaos magic. Um, I had a a really cool show here the other day on Chaos Magic. And what, what I find fascinating um, is the, the results connected with, uh, you know, a, a proper manifestation, you know, doing something the correct way. You, you get results, you can see it for yourself. And, you know, one of the things, too, uh, about Aleister Crowley that is just, you know, so I think made him ahead of his time was he, he really kind of pushed this concept of do what thou wilt is the whole of the law and people would look at that. I mean, there's you, there's two different mindsets to that statement, uh, in my opinion. And I, I would love to hear what you have to say about this because I could be way off. But in that statement, will it would be somebody's highest purpose, and anything below that is obviously just you know it doesn't matter as much. And some people think it means you can go do whatever the hell you want, and there's no repercussions. Yeah, I'd agree with you on that. I I think by will he meant you know your deepest aspirations what you um what you are destined to do um you know every man every man and woman is a star and follows a particular path or or or, or orbit uh but finding that path and dis disentangling it from all the distractions along the way um is i think you know a a bit of a danger zone in fact in all the occult dramas that I've written in the uh, Babylon and other plays. This, this is a recurrent theme. Um, I mean, we'll, we'll talk a bit later about uh, Jack Parsons because Parsons is a more complex figure than this. But for example, um, have you ever heard of a British jazz and rock musician called Graham Bond? Yes. 
Right. Uh, and you know that he committed suicide by, or apparently committed suicide, or perhaps was nudged in some direction to commit suicide under the under a subway train in, in 1974 in London. Bond was... Uh, um, Bond became an avid disciple of uh, Crowley and Thalema in the late 60s or the early 70s. But he seemed to have regarded that more or less as a license to do what the hell he liked, with sometimes disastrous re, you know, repercussions, both both for himself and and those closest to him. And I think he, I think you know there's always a temptation to feel that if you you know if you buy the books and you have the robes and you imbibe you know imbibe large quantities of substances that somehow this is automatically going to elevate you to um, some kind of godhead. But I'm afraid in Graham's case it didn't work out that way at all because he, he sort of spiralled down into massive heroin addiction which he couldn't handle. His relationships broke down. Um, he It is alleged and there's good reason for it that he had an abusive relationship with his stepdaughter. Um, and eventually was in a position where he he couldn't hold a band together he couldn't work with anybody um and he he you know he drifted into uh, uh, in, uh in, into suicide so if you like that that's an example of how you know misplacing your true will because i think bond was destined to do great things he was a brilliant musician he was a very charismatic performer he was one of the um, sort of catalysts in you know the development of British jazz and rock. He nurtured people like Jack Bruce and Ginger Baker, who promptly went off to form Cream. Um, he nurtured lots lots of other musicians, um, including my my late friend Vincent Crane, who was um, Arthur Brown's keyboard player. You've probably heard of the Crazy World of Arthur Brown. Uh -huh. I'm the God. I'm the God of Hellfire. Um, yeah, I mean Graham was an example of a man with tremendous potential, who at the same time couldn't really sort of control. The forces that that he 